Some extraordinarily troubling things occurring in Ireland at the moment, a wake-up call for the salvation of an ancient and noble civilization. But we're going to start here with a comparison between Africa and Ireland, and then it will become clear down the road as to why this comparison is being made. So, Africa, in terms of square miles, 11,677,239 square miles. It's a very, very, very big place. Ireland is 32,599 square miles. Just a little bit of a smidge smaller. In fact, Africa is over 358 times the size of Ireland. What about population? Africa has a population that is north of 1.3 billion people, which is 16.64% of the entire world's population. Ireland, on the other hand, has just over 4.8 million people, which is 0.06% of the world's population. In other words, Africa has more than 270 times the population of Ireland. And if you want to get a sense of just how disparate these two land masses are, let's have a look at them visually. So here is an outline of Africa in black. And you can see here that inside of Africa, you can fit Japan, China, China Part 2, uh, India, Eastern Europe, Italy, the United States, Germany, France, Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and a couple of other miscellaneous places. And down here in the, in the island off the coast of Africa is the UK, and just a tiny, tiny little bit down there is Ireland. So Africa is a troubled continent, to put it mildly, and uh, I have gone into the reasons for that, or the primary reasons for that, many times in my presentations in the past. But suffice to say that you cannot solve the problems in Africa by moving portions of the population to Ireland. All it will do is swamp and overrun and destroy a country, an island, that has for hundreds of years fought for independence from the English and now is facing subjugation through other means. In fact, the erasure of its cultural historical identity. So what are we talking about? Well, there's a document which is called Ireland 2040. And it is a 25-year Irish government planning document. Now, this should raise your hackles of suspicion enormously just to begin with because governments do not plan 25 years ahead. They simply don't. They barely plan six months ahead. When they sell bonds, uh, it's in order to buy votes in the here and now. They don't care about when the bonds come due. If you look at national uh, debts, that is the pillaging of the unborn for the sake of, again, buying votes in democracies in the here and now. So the idea that the governments are just so wise, so benevolent, so forward thinking that they're going to plan a quarter century ahead is nonsense. So what is going on? So the prime minister, chief executive and head of government in Ireland is a fellow named Leo Varadkar. He's a gay man born to Indian parents and he kind of shuffled into power without a direct election from the Irish people. And it's just a little odd in many ways for such a person to be deciding the entire future of Ireland. The document has also been co-authored by Frances Fitzgerald, who, you know, seems like proto-leftist feminist. She had this to say about pay equity laws. I have dedicated most of my adult life to tackling inequality, especially gender inequality, Prior to serving as a TD, I was chair of the National Women's Council of Ireland. And as well as my own experiences of being a working mother, I am keenly aware of the need to improve gender equality in the workplace. So this tells you everything you need to know. She has the standard leftist approach, which says this. All disparities in group outcomes are the result of prejudice, of racism, of sexism, of colonialism, of exploitation, of generally bad white male behavior. So this is foundational as to what is going on. The disparity in wealth, in achievement, in stability, in lack of corruption between European countries and African countries is startling. It is startling. Now, if you come from the equation or from the perspective that every single 
group is exactly the same as any other group, then you have no way of explaining why some groups do better than others, except for an appeal to endless bigotry, racism, sexism, and so on. However, the reason, of course, that Africa is doing poorly, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, is that the average IQ of the sub-Saharan black African is in the low 70s, which is the bottom 2 to 3 percent of the white population. That is the fundamental reason as to why it is doing so poorly, thinking that it is all the same, everyone is the same, all disparities must be the result of prejudice, is false. It's anti-scientific. It is a hysterical cult-like belief of radical egalitarianism that flies in the face of a hundred years of IQ testing. So this is where she's coming from. And I assume, since she's a co-author, this is driving the entire document. So let's start having a look at the document itself, which is a tragic a document. Uh, it is a horrifying document. It is in some ways a culturally erasing document. And it's not often that you get to read a eulogy prior to the death. So here's a sample. The document says, by 2040, we know that Ireland will be home to an additional 1 million people. We will need at least an extra 600,000 jobs and a half a million additional homes. 20 years ago, we were a country of 3.5 million. By 2040, that will be approaching 6 million people. Together with Northern Ireland, our island will have a population of around 8 million by 2040. Now, the way that this population growth is presented is, well, it's an inevitability. It's like aging. It's like getting taller if you eat food and you're a child. It's just what happens. It's absolutely inevitable. It's like erosion. It's like anything. You can't possibly fight it as if it's just happening, as if people are just coming to Ireland in general from the third world. There's absolutely nothing that can be done about it. And therefore, we just have to find ways to link arms together and tackle this absolute inevitability. But of course, it's not inevitable. It's not inevitable whatsoever. The choice to add hundreds of thousands of people to a tiny island and a small population is a specific choice made by the government to grant immigration, refugee status, citizenship, and so on. These are all choices that are made. Yet it is always presented as if, well, you know, people are just in motion. The world is just becoming more diverse. This is false. People are not just randomly in motion. People from the third world are flocking to get into first world countries, mostly for welfare benefits and other freebies, which they can then send back to their home country and be kings of the village in a dusty place. It's not inevitable. This is a result of very specific choices. Those choices can be made. They can be unmade. You can choose to let a lot of people into your country. You can choose not to let a lot of people into your country. So these choices can be made. The document says, between now and 2040, our small but dynamic country will have to cope with enormous changes in social, economic, cultural, and environmental terms. For example, the number of people over 65 will more than double by then. Half the jobs that people will work at, work at in 2040 may not even exist today, and we are likely to be facing increased environmental and climate pressures, right? So this is the general thing. Like the, well, there's environmental issues, there's climate issues, and so on. Now, this is all a horrible, deceptive con. When I was growing up, there was an organization called ZBG, Zero Population Growth. And they said, well, you've got to stop having children because it's really, really bad for the environment. And a lot of White women, a lot of white people said, oh, well, gosh, we don't want to be bad for the environment, so let's stop having kids, or let's have fewer kids, and let's not burden the environment. So then the population, of course, began to drop. White people who are a significant minority in the world population, white people are far below replacement rates in most of their countries. There's a couple of Mormons in Utah that are, are bucking the trend. So white people said, well, you know, we want to take pressure off the environment. Let's have fewer kids. But nobody said, well, if you have fewer kids, we're going to import the third world into your country. That's quite a bait and switch. That is a horrifying thing to do to a culture, to a people, to a history, to a race. It's a horrible thing to do. Don't have kids so that you won't burden the environment. And now, if that's true, then the last thing you'd want to do is to move people from the third world to the first world because it enormously increases their consumption of nature scarce resources. Their carbon footprint grows up, goes up. They use more resources. They use more energy. And so... It's a horrible bait and switch. But you can see kind of what's simmering in the backdrop here. When governments can't pay their bills, they generally go to war. Because nobody complains about not getting their money from the government when there's a war on. Everybody pulled together, right? 
So what's happening is the boomers did not have enough kids or have enough, uh, pay enough taxes to pay for their retirements, their benefits. There's no money. There's no money in the kitty for the retirement of the boomers. So what's going to happen? Well, there's this fantasy that you can just bring all these people in from the third world and magically they're all going to just start being enormously productive despite massive IQ, cultural and religious differences. And they're just going to work their fingers to the bone to pay massive taxes to support old white people and everything's going to be hunky-dory. Now, the reality is that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You get a permanent underclass often of uh, violent criminals when you import the third world. And that's just a fact. And it's nothing negative towards people from the third world. It is just the way that nature has shaken out over 150,000 years of human evolution. Brain sizes are uh, different. Um, the reasoning powers are different. IQ tests are different. It's just a reality. So what's happening? If a politician could actually say, to retirees, there's no money, what are we going to do? You have to accept smaller benefits, you have to keep working, you have to something, something, something. Well, then you wouldn't have, but they have this false lie, basically, that you can just import people from, say, Somalia, and uh, they're all going to just immediately be productive and, and work and, and pay lots of taxes, and it's going to be fine to keep your aging population in uh, diapers and doctors. But uh, it's not it's not true. Uh, it, it's not true. Whether they know it's not true, I don't know. I mean, maybe some of the people who are in power are making these decisions based upon really terrible information. That all human beings are just interchangeable. Uh, they're not. Uh, they're not. If you move all of the Japanese people to Mexico and all of the Mexican people to Japan, you've just changed the entire civilizations. All right. So... What do they? Uh, what do they talk about? Population say about six point six million people live on the island. Sorry, on the island of Ireland, four point seven five million people in Ireland, seventy two percent of the total, and one point eight five million people in Northern Ireland, twenty eight percent of the total, and that's of twenty sixteen. By twenty forty, the island we share will be home to almost eight million people. Why? Why will it inevitably be home? What's wrong with a lower population? What's wrong with having fewer children? There's nothing wrong with it in terms of it's fine. We've got automation. We've got robots. We've got uh, streamlined tasks. We need fewer manual laborers. We need, we've got email instead of the postal service. We've got, like, forget it. You don't need all these people. Japan has an aging population, so all they're doing is investing in robots instead. Perfectly fine. So the document says planning for nearly 1.4 million extra people on this island. There are homes and places of work and the infrastructure required to support this growth while at the same time ensuring good outcomes in terms of physical and community development and environmental quality poses several shared challenges, including managing our growth strategically for long-term benefit in terms of economic and social development and environmental quality, working together for mutual advantage in areas such as economic development and promotion, coordination of social and physical infrastructure provision and environmental management. So this is the usual bureaucratic verb, make George Orwell return from the dead to claw down the pens of liver-spotted bureaucrats in government. This is just a whole bunch of adjectives thrown together that sound vaguely positive. There's no actual plan. It's like having a business plan that says, we aim to satisfy customers and, and pr provide excellence in the realm of our... It's like, Okay, what are you actually doing? Do you actually invent anything? Do you actually make anything? Do you actually have specific plans of expansion and costs? And no, it's just, you know, positive verbiage. That's the way things go. But you see, they say there's just more and more people coming and we just have to find some way to plan for this inevitability. It's not an inevitability. You can't close your borders. America did it for decades in the early to mid 20th century. Did all right. Don't have to. Take everyone in the world. You can make choices. It's not that complicated. It's not an inevitable. But they're trying. It's basic propaganda. They're trying to portray it. Well, you know, we've, we just gotta, we got to hang together and try and deal with this massive wave of people coming in from the third world. We'll find. We got to be strong. We'll find a way to do it. It's like, it's not inevitable. Ireland existed for thousands of years without hundreds of thousands of people pouring in from the third world. What changed? Document goes on to say the national planning framework is the government's plan to cater for the extra one million people that would be living in Ireland. The additional two thirds of a million people working in Ireland and the half a million extra homes needed in Ireland by 2040. Why will there be an extra million people? 
Say, in today's globally connected societies and economies, says the document, people, goods, capital, knowledge, and data are moving more and more quickly between countries, within regions, and around our communities. The effects of these changes are reshaping the way in which local communities and regions develop. Technology driven by science and innovation is increasingly influencing our way of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> words, words, words. Now, people are not moving more quickly between countries uh, unless you know of a hidden pipeline of people from Ireland who are desperately moving to Somalia with the aid of international human smugglers. It's, it's not, it's, the world is not becoming more diverse. People from non-white countries are desperate to get into white countries. It's all a one-way street. There's no, virtually no reciprocity whatsoever. Well, I, I guess that uh, occasionally deluded, propagandized, and lied to leftists go and try and spread a whole load of egalitarian love in places like Morocco and get their heads sawn off in the videos shot and sent to their mothers. Climate change is an issue, says the document, facing the world in the 21st century. And now, more than at any time before, we are aware of the importance of looking after the physical and natural environment around us and its influence on our long-term health and well-being. Yeah, so if there's a population decline among high-energy-using people, that's good for the environment. If you then import a bunch of low-energy-using people into high-energy-usage situations, we're not just talking about them coming to work. If someone comes from... Somalia, with almost no carbon footprint, uh, comes to, say, Germany and gets thousands of euros in healthcare and benefits and welfare and free laptops and so on, then a lot of that money is being borrowed, right? Now, if a lot of that money is being borrowed, it means that you're pillaging natural resources in the here and now with debt, which is really terrible. Like, national debts are incredibly bad for the environment because it squanders a huge amount of natural resources inefficiently now that some of which are not renewable. So, of course, if people were into environmentalism, really into environmentalism, they would get rid of central banking. They would um, stop the government from al uh, being allowed to issue debts and, and bonds and notes and so on. But environmentalists are just useful idiots for leftists. When economic output and stability are measured, says the document, Ireland is firmly within the top 10 countries in the world, scoring highly in terms of gross domestic product or GDP per capita, human development, democracy, and foreign direct investment. Right. So it ain't broke. Why are you trying to fix it? Why are you trying to change it? It's working. It's working well. Why? Because it's a largely white population. The whites have an average IQ of about 100 and a long history with small government and free markets. So can't just replace all of those people without changing the entire country. Document says it is important that we maintain and improve this positioning whilst also recognizing that the pattern of Ireland's comparison ranking in areas such as quality of life and environmental performance is not quite as high, placing us just within the top 20 countries in the world. Dublin is ranked outside the top 30 cities in the world for livability. Yeah, see, one of the reasons for that is because you have a lot of third world crime in Dublin. Document says, it is clear that our population will increase, but will become older and also more diverse and will be dependent on a proportionately smaller number of people of working age. A growing and changing society will have different needs. And again, it's clear that our population will increase like there's just nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's going to happen. It's like, it's like the tides. What can you do? You got to just deal with the tides. It's like all choices, all specific choices. And... They say here, older and more diverse, why will it become more diverse? And more diverse, you understand, always means fewer white people. That's all it means. All it ever means is fewer white people. A, a proportionately smaller number of people of working age. Now, I mean, that's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. It's the result of huge government programs. And it's also the result of existing diversity, where particular ethnic groups, on average, uh, get subsidized by whites and in general white males basically the only productive taxpayers in western societies and so you are taking money from smarter people and giving money to less smart people it's a welfare state as a whole it's a dysgenics i'm against eugenics i'm against dysgenics always have been which is why i'm against the welfare state but yeah you have a big problem and the solution to that of course is smaller government and fewer forced transfers of wealth that's that's the solution that's the answer and 
there will be need for more automation because you have this inverted pyramid, as you have in Japan, where you have more old people in diapers than babies in diapers. You have this inverted pyramid, where there's a lot of old people hanging off the productivity of a lot of young people, and you have to find a way to solve that. And some of it's going to have to be there's just not enough money for old people. You've got to suck it up. And you guys were voting long before the younger generations, and you voted for a lot of free stuff, and the bill comes due. And, like, you know, young people have to go to war throughout history. Now old people have to take less. Because the alternative is you import the third world and destroy your countries. So the document goes on to say the ESRI projects that the population of Ireland will increase by almost 1 million people or by 20% over 2016 levels to around 5.75 million people by 2040. It just, it's just a projection. It's just a projection. <laughs> you know, it's like some guy saying, some, some boyfriend saying, well, Hey, man, I've got this document from the government. It projects that we're going to have a significantly increasing number of threesomes over the next 15 years. It's going to go from zero to one a week. It, hey, man, it's a government document. Uh, I guess I guess we're just going to have to. I'm going to have to grow a porn stash. We're going to have to get a weird series of oils and, and robes. We're going to have to get um, the lava lamps and Enya CDs and, you know, Hey, we've got this document says we're going to get have, we're just going to have more threesomes. It's just it's going to happen. We got to find some way to plan for it together. At which point, right, she'd slap you across the face and saying, "Don't wave this thing around like something's inevitable. We choose to have threesomes or not." Hopefully not. <laughs> but no, no, man, it's a document. Hey, it's it projections. I, I wrote these projections in in crayon. In developing Ireland, twenty forty. It is apparent that we have so many authentic communities and places with so much potential that there is no clear justification for the creation of entirely new settlements. It is the case, however, that many of our urban places are in need of improvement, regeneration and revitalization, and that many of our rural places are either at risk from urban generated overspill or are suffering from depopulation. So what this means is you're going to move people from the third world into ancient communities where they've been staring at sheep for a thousand years. Have never met a black man, have no additional language skills, no cultural connection skills and so on. So yeah, they're basically saying, well, we're not gonna create new areas for all of these third worlders. What we're going to do is we're gonna put them into your communities, whether you like it or not. And you're gonna to have to pay the taxes to support them and their many, many children. Planning. They say, it's clear that in the years ahead, more choices will be needed to accommodate changes in our society in response to greater diversity, increased numbers of older people, new ways of working and communicating, meeting competitiveness challenges, and in addressing climate change. It will be important for future choices to be genuine and based on trade-offs that can influence behavior towards more sustainable outcomes. Again, this is just brain-dissolving word goo. Nobody knows what it means. Uh, it's just basically shut up and take immigrants take migrants take just take them they say a fair society with strong social cohesion and converging living standards throughout the country in which all individuals businesses communities and regions have the opportunity to prosper yeah you know interestingly enough there's a pretty good way to have strong social cohesion and that's to have people of the same race and culture in a country it's just the way it works and if you doubt me, you think I'm saying something me weird or mean. No, no, no. This guy named Robert Putnam, P-U-T-N-A-M. Uh, sorry, P-U-T-M-A-N. Robert Putnam did research. He sat on it for five years because he was so horrified at the outcomes. He did all this research and multi-ethnic, multicultural, quote, diverse societies have lower social trust, worse outcomes, people cocoon, they stay in. There's a reason why kids are getting fat. It's because everyone's afraid to send their kids out into multicultural neighborhoods and so on. It, it just destroys trust. Destro I mean, we're tribal. Babies prefer people of their own ethnicity. It's how evolution works. It's how society works. Uh, you can get mad at it if you want, but I mean, you know, I'm telling the truth. Don't shoot the messenger, right? They say the biggest issue addressed in this framework is where best to plan for our growing population and economy. We, it's inevitable. We just got to find a way to plan for it. And again, there's this Soviet style national policy objective, the 25 year INGSOC plan. They say in terms of Ireland's future population, targeting this pattern is significant because it represents a shift from projected trends. In the context of around 1 million additional people in Ireland by 2040, it means planning for 
And then there's all these, you know, Eastern and Midland region targeted 475,000 to 500,000 additional people. Northern and Western region, 150 to 175,000 additional people. Southern region, 350 to 375, and so on. And I mean, that shows you just how, how, what a terrible lie democracy is. Like if you want to import a huge number of people who don't speak the language of a, of a different race, different culture, different history, different religion. Shouldn't you ask people? Shouldn't you say, hey, do you guys want any of this? Do you guys want a whole bunch of Somalians uh, put into the backwaters in a small town in Ireland? Why? Why would you want that? I mean, I understand why the Somalians want it, for sure. I mean, of course, right? But why, why would the local population, how would they benefit? What's, what's great about that? It's just going to create these, these cysts, these, these bubbles, right? I mean, you understand this, right? Let's say you're, you're British and, and, and so on, and, and you live on a street, and next door moves in someone who grew up in your hometown. They're British, uh, they're white, they're Christians, whatever, right? Well, you, you have, it's just easier to, to know how to interact. And, and, but let's say some Somali family moves in, they don't speak English, and they're Muslim. Are you going to have the same level of social cohesion? This isn't brain surgery, people. Come on. There's a reason why... The people who come into Western countries tend to live around each other all the time. There's a reason why there are Muslim enclaves, not to mention Greek enclaves or, or Italian. People just, it's just so efficient and it's so easy. If you share the same language, history and culture, it's just so much easier to have a community. In fact, it's what makes community possible. And, you know, if, if you have kids and someone from your race and your neighborhood moves in next door, your kids, you, know, you can send your kids over there. You know what's going on. You know what the situation is. Are you going to send your kids over to some Somali Muslim's house where you don't even, they, you don't speak the same language, don't have the same values? Well, no. Right? This, is, this is not that complicated. They say, in similar terms, applying the ESRI projections for up to two-thirds of a million additional jobs in Ireland means planning for a pattern of and all these additional jobs and so on. Yeah, like the government can just, you know, snap their fingers, wave their hands and just make additional jobs. How about having a free market? How about not paying people to come to your country? I don't know. It seems like we've forgotten all of this stuff completely. Well, we'll learn again. It'll just be kind of painful. So this is a picture from the document. And, you know, I'm well versed in propaganda. I know when propaganda is occurring, right? So you have this, you, your, fa your face is drawn to the redhead, bright, smiling face of the white woman here. And you don't really look in the background to see all of these Middle Eastern people. And I don't know, is that a Chinese woman or something like that or an Indian guy? You, 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 so this is a way of just, it's programming. It just programs you. you. Your face is drawn. Oh, look, there's a, smiley, a positive, smiley white woman and in the background. You, you're just, just supposed to sink and dwell, you know. This is, where, this is what Ireland's going to look like. So if you want to have an honest discussion about this, this stuff, based upon the experience of other countries, the welfare costs for third world immigrants can be projected. Now, just to be clear, not all of this population growth is going to come from third world immigration. Uh, some of it's going to come from, you know, white people in Ireland having kids. But, you know, where there is third world immigration, you can look at the welfare costs. It's pretty, pretty easy, right? So like three quarters of immigrants into America are on welfare. And I think it's about half of them. It just goes on decade after decade, right? So you can figure out how much the welfare costs are going to be for third world immigrants based upon the experiences of other countries. If you look at, say, the people who came in to, from the Middle East to Germany, I mean, how many of them are working productively? Uh, how many of them have learned German? Uh, how many of them uh, are, are not taking welfare or social services? It's, it's easy to figure out. So you can easily project what these costs are going to be. You can do the same based upon the experience of other countries. You can do the same for crime, for congestion. Healthcare consumption is huge. So if you have a culture that comes in that is very pro-cousin marriage, you're going to have massive amounts of healthcare costs because of genetic defects and, and low, low IQ. And like um, uh, cousin marriage shaves 10 plus IQ points off the population as a whole. So, I mean, just look, you can look this up. In, in the Pakistani community in England is disproportionately using the healthcare system and crowding out other people. So what are the costs of having a lot of extra languages in uh, the healthcare system or the educational system or at work or you name it, right? So you can easily, easily find out this information and present it and say, you know, based upon the experiences of other countries, based upon his historical experiences of people from these regions in Ireland, 
we can tell you that it's going to cost this, you're going to have to pay this more in taxes, you're going to have to wait this much longer to get a doctor, your child's education is going to be degraded by this percentage because resources are put into other things and things and so on, right? Why, why, why not talk about these massive extra costs? Right, so this, this has nothing to do with economic efficiency. This is nothing to do. This is cultural erasure of the first order. Now this, I, I found this quite, quite astonishing just for, for notes, right? People with disabilities, there were approximately 650,000 people with a disability in Ireland in 2016. 13.5% of the population. <sighs> that is, that's a lot. I'm just pointing it out. Some of it has to do with aging, but I'm just saying that's a lot. So huge amounts of central planning going on in these documents, right? Strategic employment growth at regional and local level should include consideration of current employment, location, density of workers, land take and resource infrastructure dependency, locations for expansion. And you can just read all of this. You can pause it if you want. But this is all just, you know, well, we, we have to take into account costs and benefits in our business plan. It's like, ooh, you're a business genius. What did that uh, Harvard MBA give you that kind of incredible insight? It's like they're just a bunch of words, a bunch of positive adjectives and we have to balance this with this. It's like, do you have any actual plans? No. Well, other than Bye Bye Ireland. So planning for diverse rural places. National policy objective 14. Boy, if that didn't give you a 1984 chill thrill down your spine, I don't know what will. Ensure that the targeted population growth of Ireland's small towns and rural areas to 2040 is proportionate at a targeted average rate of 15% in each regional assembly area to be applied regionally through the regional spatial and economic strategy process and locally through county development plans. Now, it's going to put Africa into Ireland. Again, not all the immigrants are going to be coming from Africa, but targeted population growth, like who the hell are you people? Who the hell are you narcissistic, vainglorious lunatics who think that you can just play massive chess with a long-standing ancient community. Who are you to say that you can just shuffle people in and out and have these big giant plans and anyone who disagrees with you is, you know, uh, I just, it's, it's, the people are, are crazy. No humility. So they want to reverse the national policy objective 15, target the reversal of rural decline in the core of small towns and villages through sustainable targeted measures that address vacancy and deliver sustainable reuse and regeneration outcomes. It sounds like they're, it like, it sounds like they're farmers talking about crops. Sustainable reuse and regeneration outcomes. They're human beings with histories. 18B, because you know, just having 18A would be crazy. In rural areas under urban influence to facilitate the provision of single housing in the countryside based on the core consideration of demonstrable economic need to live in a rural area and relevant Citing criteria for rural housing and statutory guidelines and plans. See, you, you got to prove your need to live in a rural area. You, you, you got to apply to live where you might want to live, you see. Because these masters of the universe know what's best for everyone. And if you disagree, to hell with you. I think literally. Now, of course, a lot of this has to do with propping up boomers, right? So um, there's a, a big mm, problem that the modern capitalism, crony capitalism economies are facing, which is that there's so much of economic value is tied up in the maintenance of real estate values. And we saw, you know, when, so in America, what they did in the, well, starting in the 90s, is that they forced banks to lend to unqualified minorities. And by minorities, I'm not talking Japanese and Chinese, right? I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about blacks and Hispanics, right? The people at the lower end of the IQ spectrum. And they said, well, you know, blacks and Hispanics, they don't own enough homes. So what we're going to do is we're going to force banks to make loans to people. And so they had to change all their standards. They had to accept what were called liars loans, which is, you know, how much do you make? Just pencil it in and you can't verify it and so on. And then in general, when the blacks and Hispanics uh, faced, because of variable rate mortgages, they faced increases in their mortgage payments, they couldn't afford them. And you had a housing crash, which almost took down the entire world's economy and required $700 billion plus emergency injection of us white created Zimbabwe monopoly money to prop it all up. And um, so if the value of real estate goes down, then the entire 
Western pretend economy collapses. Now, I mean, in my view, the sooner the better. Let's just rip the Band-Aid off and, and start building something that's based on real money with actual real assets, not have the government type whatever it wants into its own bank account and think we're going to result in something other than a hellscape of economic mis mismanagement, disaster, uh, wealth drain, and collapse. But no politician wants to be at the helm when the ship hits the iceberg, right? So they're just trying to do anything they can to prop up the value of boomer housing. Now, if they, of course, had any idea of economic planning, what they'd say is, well, you know, birth rates are pretty low in Western countries. So what happens when birth rates are low? Well, what happens when birth rates are low is the demand for housing declines enormously, right? And so the housing price goes down, right? So if you have in Italy, you have like one person or so being born for every two people, right? So rough gauge, it means that the demand for housing is going to go down by 50%, which means that the price of houses are going to drop enormously, 25%, 30%, 40%. That's good, right? We want, because then what happens is people can buy houses cheaper, they have more money to raise kids, and it all kind of balances out. You have more kids, right? But nobody wants to go through that process of housing prices going down because that's going to expose all of the junk, garbage, crap that passes for the economy in the modern West. It's not a free market. It hasn't been since 1913, at least in America. So what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is they're bringing in people from the third world. They borrow money to give those people welfare. Those people then need housing, buy housing. That drives up demand for housing, which goes all the way up, right? It drives people out of particular communities. They buy houses further out, further out, further up, right? It's like pushing the bottom of a ladder. The top of the ladder goes up as well. When people have a demand for cheap housing, the more expensive housing goes up as well. So they're bringing people in to prop up the boomer's real estate value so that the entire house of cards doesn't come crashing down, or at least it will. I mean, the money's going to run out anyway. The money's going to run out no matter what. The debts are too big. The deficits are too big. So the question is, what kind of demographics do you want around you when the money runs out? Do you want people who are going to shrug and say, ah, well, I guess I'll get a job? Or do you want people who are going to pull out their machetes and go to town? So 5.4 age-friendly communities. As projections indicate that the number of people aged over 65 were more than double to almost 1.3 million people by 2040, 23% of the population. This compares to 13.5% in 2016. In addition, it is expected that the population aged over 85 will quadruple. As people get older, they're likely to have increasingly complex healthcare needs with a requirement for services and facilities to support provision of suitable and necessary care, right? I mean, this is, I have some sympathy for the boomers, but not a huge amount because I've been talking to them for decades about this and they just go la 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 la. But um, yeah, I mean, the government had a great scam, right? They, they took money from people saying this is for your retirement. They spent it on junk and garbage and vote buying and, and mansions and crap. And now there's no money for the boomers retirement. Yeah, sorry. It's what happens when you trust the government, right? They'll, they'll just take and take and take. And um, I don't know what to say other than uh, you should have listened to libertarians. Diverse and inclusive Ireland, right? So this is right. In moving towards a more diverse society over the last half century, Ireland's population is more varied than ever before, comprising a range of ethnicities and nationalities. And uh, yeah, it's a, um, you can read all of this if you want, but yeah, this is just it's inevitability. It's going to become more diverse. People are in motion and, and so on, right? And uh, it's like this uh, UN migration compact, right? And basically, it's a human right to get access to white men's wallets. That's just the way things are going. So again, we're looking to housing. When combined with the older population, the dependency ratio is projected to increase to 65% by 2040, up from 53% in 2016. Right, so those aged under 16 and those aged over 65, right? It's a hell of a way to destroy an entire culture, which is to promise massive benefits to the old people while discouraging people from having children. I mean, it's a, it's a slow fuse, but it is a huge explosion at the end. National policy objective 33, target the delivery of 550,000 additional households up to 2040 in accordance with the policy objectives, right? So how are you going to save the environment and build 550,000 new homes? How are you going to deal with climate change and build 550,000 new homes? That's wood that needs to be cut down. That's concrete that needs to be poured. That's stuff that needs to be like electricity and, and sewage and, and, and you name it. Glass and right? all of nature's scarce resources. Well, you can't, right? You can't do both. So, again... 
It's all about keeping housing values up, at least in the short run. Ireland's future homes will. Now, here's the thing, right? Can't you just let people build where they want to build based upon the... No, you can't do that. You've got to build your homes in places where, which can support sustainable development. Places which support growth, innovation, and the efficient provision of infrastructure are accessible to a range of local services and can encourage the use of public transport, walking and cycling, and help, help tackle climate change. Future homes will be delivered in our cities and larger towns and still be located in our villages, towns, and open countrysides, but at the appropriate scale that does not detract from the capacity of our larger towns and cities to deliver homes more sustainably. See, no freedom anymore. You'll build where we tell you to build. You'll not build where we tell you not to build. Because there's a plan. National Policy Objective 35, implement measures to reduce vacancy and to progressively target the reduction of the national housing vacancy rate to 5%, currently 9.15%. Right, and that's the result, right? I mean, Ireland just legalized abortion and so on, and, and um, you've got the boomers, you've got the millennials, you, you Gen X millennials and so on. Housing demand is gonna go down, so we gotta stuff it full of third worlders on welfare just to prop up the values. Now, household size continues to decline. Seven out of 10 households in the state consists of three people or less. In Dublin city, one, two, and three person households comprise 80% of all households. Yet the stock of housing in Ireland is largely comprised of detached and semi-detached houses with three to four bedrooms. Well, you know, tell white people not to have babies, ban them, um, well, legalize abortion, end the ban on, on, on abortion. And that's what you get. Now, the environmentalism uh, is, is all over the place in this document, right? So they say Ireland has experienced a relatively high rate of land use change since the early 1990s. Recent population growth has led to an increase in the extent of dispersed residential and commercial development, as well as new infrastructure, which have resulted in pressure on agricultural land, designated nature conservation areas, and water quality. So clearly very concerned about the environment. So if the population is going down and automation is going up, that's good because it's fewer, it's less need for the environment. If your population is going down, it means housing prices are gonna go down, which means people can move into houses that they couldn't otherwise be in, which are already there, so you don't have to build new ones. Anyway, they say in catering for an additional 1 million people and a move towards alternative energy sources, increased demand for land is likely to include suitable locations for bioenergy supply food production, forestry, and other land services alongside the need to build more houses, schools, and other facilities. Why do you need to build? Because you're importing huge numbers of people from overseas. Why, why, why do you need to build more? You've got a vacancy rate, close to 10%. Why do you need to build more? How does this square with trying to save the environment? Competition for land resources needs careful management, and the nature and rate of land use Change indicates where future environmental pressures are likely to arise. All these geniuses, they know exactly where people should live and how and why. Under Ireland 2040, the government will support integrating climate considerations into statutory plans and guidelines in order to reduce vulnerability to negative effects and avoid inappropriate forms of development in vulnerable areas. See, they, the bureaucrats know what is appropriate and what's inappropriate. They know what's valuable and not valuable. They know what's economically and environmentally sustain, sustainable and, and what's not. They, they just, they know. They know what the population of Ireland should be in 25 years. They know where everyone should live. They know what the house prices should be. They, they just know everything, which means that they're insane. We know virtually nothing. Now, our transition to a low carbon energy future requires a shift from predominantly fossil fuels to predominantly renewable energy sources. Increasing efficiency and upgrades to appliances, buildings and systems, decisions around development and deployment of new Technologies relating to areas such as wind, smart grids, electric vehicles, buildings, ocean energy, and bioenergy. Legal and regulatory frameworks to meet demands and challenges in transitioning to a low-carbon society. But you see, you're already transitioning to a low-carbon society, Ireland, by having fewer children. Already dealing with climate change by having fewer children. Well, environmental groups are well paid to not talk about immigration. But it's all, yeah, magical thinking. Yeah, there's all this ocean energy, this bioenergy, just lying around, just lying around. No capitalists seem to want to invest their money into it because you can't find a way to make any money. But, you know, it's just lying around. Now, if any of this has seemed confusing to you, and look, I understand. I mean, I spent a lot of time going over this document. If, if any of this stuff seems confusing to you, 
don't worry. They have a, a, a wheel of clarity. Let's have a look. See? This, this should solve, solve it for you. Just stare at this until it makes sense because it, it, it's a wheel of clarity. It's not a tunnel into the vainglorious narcissistic madness of bureaucraties. It is, it's, a, it's a tunnel into clear uh, clarity. And this is just one particular aspect of this. So you can look through the document and please, heaven above, do look through this document. This is deadly stuff, literally deadly stuff to your entire history and way of life. But let's go into some more details and then we'll end with the conclusion. So, 500,000. This is the number of migrants that Tonishta Simon Coveney, Deputy Prime Minister, projected Ireland will accept over the next 20 years, which contributes to the population increase of 1 million by 2040. The remaining 500,000 will be made up of their children subsequently born in Ireland and Ireland's existing birth rate which now that abortion is legalized will go down considerably, of course. And as people pour into the country from the third world, what's going to happen is they're going to need a lot of resources, healthcare taxes, they're going to tax the white population and give money to. So yeah, it's going to be population replacement, plain and simple. If you let it happen, it's up to you. Now, how did this number come about? Has this been part of a vigorous and open public debate? No. Coveney revealed this figure at a community meeting he held at a Dublin bar and grill in November 2018 while answering a surprise question on the global compact on migration from a member of the public in a Q&A session. He was unaware he was being recorded. The media have not published this figure. God forbid, God forbid, you actually let people decide who lives in their communities. Minister of Health Simon Harris described the Ireland 2040 project as a major plan which was going to shape the development of Ireland for the next number of years, backed up by millions and millions and billions of euros in capital investment, which is, of course, our momentary reminder, which we need, apparently a lot. Government has no money. It borrows. It prints. It takes through force. The countries of origin for the projected 500,000 migrants have not been stated by the government. <sighs> Wakanda. Comments made by some officials suggest a large percentage of the migrants could be of African origin. Remember the size of Ireland, the size of Africa, the population disparities. Come on, come on. Tonishta Simon Kaveni focused on Africans in his response to the question on the Global Compact on Migration stating that the continent of Africa was expected to have an extra billion people over the next 25 to 30 years, and that we need to find new ways of addressing the realities of the mass movement of people by trying to create societies and economies that people want to be part of. He said the EU needs to help African countries lower their birth rate by elevating their development in a much more ambitious partnership with Africa. Yeah, if you don't have have fewer children environmental impact pamphlets in, in, in Arabic and, and uh, Zulu, and uh, then you're just a racist who's just trying to get white people to have fewer kids, right? Um, continent of Africa was expected to have an extra billion people. Why? Why, why? why has the population in Africa gone up so enormously? Because white countries have been dropping huge amounts of food and, and, and money and all of that into Africa, which has caused... Right. So if you give money to people with a high IQ, they generally convert it into things like education and, and art and, and so on with some kids. If you give a huge amount of resources to people with a low IQ, they just have more and more and more children. The birth rate of five to six kids per family in, in Africa. Right. You understand you can take all these people into Ireland and what they'll do is they will take the welfare that you're going to give them and they'll ship all of that money to Africa to countries in Africa, where it will be converted into extra children who will then want to come to your country. I, I, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but this is the, we, we can't live in these imaginary clouds of, of perfect outcomes. We have to look at the basic facts of, of, of what actually happens in the world, which very few people want to, want to see. Brian Hayes, MEP for Fine Gael, the ruling party in Ireland, stated in 2015, quote, if Europe wants the very social market economy continuing for future generations, then increasing our population is a crucial requirement. I'm not suggesting for a moment that we have an open door policy. That would be as irresponsible as doing nothing. 
But we must recognize that population growth in Africa over the next 30 years will see an additional billion people being born in that continent. That's twice the size of Europe. By 2050, the population of Nigeria in 10 years could be over 400 million people. The pressures of population growth in other parts of the world will inevitably bring more people to Europe. We need to turn it to our advantage. Why? Why will it bring more people to Europe? You you can choose not to let more people into Europe. That's a choice. It's how Europe functioned for thousands of years. Um, Here's the thing, too. There was a huge population growth in the late 1940s, 1950s, the baby boom, right? People were having four or five kids a family, right? Huge population growth. How did Western countries handle and manage this massive population growth? Did they all say, well, you know, we're having a huge population growth, man. We better all run to Nigeria. We better, we better make sure that, that other countries open up their borders to all of our excess population. It's not what happened. It's not what happened. See, everybody understands the population growth in Africa is generally the reproduction of people with very low IQs. I wish it were different. I I, I desperately wish it were different, but it's not. If wishes were horses, beggars would ride. And I was taught, look at reality, look at the facts, don't live in a fantasy land of, of what you want. Look at the reality of what is. You know, when there was a Second World War, did the population of Europe uh, uh, flee by the millions to the Middle East and try to become refugees? And No. So, stop sending money to Africa. All right. Jamie Drummond, Executive Director of One, spoke to Ireland's Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade and Defense in December 2017. Drummond co-founded one with Bono and other activists to facilitate the immigration of Africa's doubling population into Europe. Why? Why? China had a huge population growth. They didn't all come to Europe. I mean, (laughs) our high IQ China. He told the committee, quote, as Africa's population doubles, a lot of them, whatever the circumstances, will be coming to Europe as economic migrants or as refugees. They will be coming, many of them, and that is a good thing if they come into a place with an open mind and those economies are doing well because we will be senile. We will be senescent demographically. We'll need their youthful energy to do stuff. So that is just what the economic statistics tell you and the demographic data demands, you know. And demography is destiny. Europe and Africa are going to have a very close 21st century. So I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if they're economically wonderfully productive people, why on earth would they need to come to Europe? You know what would be great is that if, let's just say, Africa was full of very smart people, then Africa would become a wonderful continent of, of market, free market productivity. And that would bring down prices for everyone in the West, which would mean that old people would get more purchasing power for their retirement funds. It would be a huge increase in the value of their retirement if Africa could become like Japan or, or, or China. I mean, China's still pretty dictatorial, but you know what I mean, right? So if, well, you know, we got a lot of old people and, and therefore we need a better economy, it's like, well, then we've got all this youthful energy, they say. That there's wonderfully economic, economically productive people in Africa. So they should stay there, grow their market economies, you know, produce the next Amazon, produce the next whatever innovation, uh, jetpacks and teleportation devices and, and uh, you know, automated spaceships or whatever, right? They should do all of that. And that will drive down the cost for everyone else, which will increase the value of people's retirement funds. If they're so competent, why... Can't they keep their youthful energy in their own countries? Well, because everyone knows that more Africans is not going to be more value to the world economy. In, as a whole, like it's, it's, it's sub-Saharan Africa in particular, IQ in the low 70s, it's still a bell curve, still some smart Africans out there for sure, but proportional to the general population. Like you understand that 70 is the cutoff, or at least used to be for mental retardation which means that on average, close to half the population of blacks in sub-Saharan Africa uh, uh, are in the category of mentally retarded. And, you know, again, I wish it were different. God, do I wish it were different. But it's not. It's not. 
Nobody knows how to change it. Oh, even if it was 100% environmental, nobody knows how to change it. Nobody knows how to change it. Bono. And you give yourself away. Yeah, you give everyone else away, you rich bastard. Population projections. Here's some numbers. 50.4%, the percentage of under 14s who will have a migrant background by 2061 in Ireland, according to a 2011 Eurostat study on population projections for EU nations. Across all ages, the percentage was 45.1%. This was seven years before the Ireland 2040 project was announced. 2061, not that far away. Not that far away. I could still be alive. Percentage of under 14s with a migrant background. And generally, that means non-white, right? Now, if you want to see what happens to whites when they become a minority, you can look at South Africa. You can look at uh, Zimbabwe when, when the blacks gain political power. They, well, you can look. It's not hard to figure out. 200%. The increase in population, Tonishta, Simon Cavani, Deputy Prime Minister, says he wants for every city outside Dublin over the next 20 to 30 years. He says over the next 20 to 30 years, effectively, we want to attempt to double the size of all the, the cities in population terms outside of Dublin. So that, see, here's the problem. So if you've backed yourself into a corner economically, if you simply don't have the population base and the tax base to pay for your retirement boomers, then encouraging people to have children, which has been done in some Eastern European countries. Encouraging people to have children is a problem because it's kind of too late, right? Because when people have kids, the government has to spend more money on, on health care, on, on schools, on, on you name it, right? On, on moms, hopefully being decent moms and raising their children at home. So if you want people to have kids to make up for a population and taxation deficit, well, it takes 20 to 25 years for people to start paying taxes and your costs are very high. So by that time, all the boomers will be dead. And right. So you can't they've left it so long. If they really wanted to plan 25 years ahead, they'd have said in the 70s. No, no, no. You guys got to have lots of kids, lots of kids, because we needed a huge tax base to pay for the retirement of the boomers. You guys got to have kids, 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 kids. But they didn't. Right. Because it was all about reducing the white population because of anti-white hatred, because white success is always ascribed to racism and theft and colonialism and stealing resources from the third world. And right, this is, white privilege is just an excuse for anti-white hatred. And so, so what happened was they, there's now a population, a small population and a huge bunch of retirees. So the fantasy is, well, we'll just import a bunch of people from Africa, we'll plug them into the existing economy, and they'll just start producing tax revenue right away. None of this expensive, problematic childhood and education, we're just going to hoover them up and they're going to make us tons of money. But it's not. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. The exact opposite is going to happen. And I don't know how many people know that or not. Like, I don't know. I don't know if these guys have just been lied to their whole lives, but what's going to happen is there's going to be massive amounts of racial conflict, potentially civil war. And that may be the best outcome. The worst outcome could just be complete capitulation and the loss of your entire culture and history. Like I'm telling you, I wish it were different. Please understand. I wish it were different. But these, um, these facts are far too important for us to just lie about them. 50%. The percentage of Longford County's population, which will be of a mixture of different foreign ethnicities by 2050, according to Longford's Joint Policing Committee at a publicly convened meeting in November 2017. 10 million. 10 million, the all island population of Ireland, Tonishta Simon Cavani wants Ireland to prepare for by 2050, according to a document outlining his policy priorities. For the Fine Gael leadership contest in May 2017, his projected figure was 8 million by 2030. He also supports a new path to citizenship for illegal immigrants who have been in Ireland for more than three years. Guys, look, you've got to wake up, do something, do something. God's sakes. So the current demography, 82.8%, the percentage of the population who were ethnically Irish, white, in the 2016 census for 85 years old and older 94.1 percent irish right it's like in canada right canada 98 percent white uh, up until the 70s uh, and then pierre trudeau uh, justin trudeau's father perhaps 
uh, opened up uh, the gates to third world immigration. And so from 98% white country, within a couple decades, uh, whites are going to go down to 20% of the population. So you can pause on this if you want. Ethnic breakdown, Irish census 2016. Uh, Irish, um, white, non-Irish, all other 7.6% in, uh, in the age groups. And, and, you know, so when you say, well, the population of whites is so-and-so, well, what matters is the population of childbearing age white women, right? So childbearing age white women are just a few percentage points of the entire world's population. We are an incredible, tiny minority as far as reproduction goes. But, you know, we just want to help all these minorities. Well, how about helping ourselves? So... Four, a little over 4.7 million population of Ireland. 16.2% of people are foreign-born in Ireland, according to the 2016 census, excluding people born in Northern Ireland. The credibility of the census figures are in question. In 2012, the Polish ambassador to Ireland estimated that the number of Poles in Ireland was 28,000 higher than the census figure of 122,585. Plus 50,000 in 2018, the respective ambassadors of the Baltic states estimated that the number of their citizens in Ireland was 50,000 higher than the census figure of 60,000, right? So if the government wants to have you not panic about population replacement, then they're going to downplay the numbers as much as possible, right? Plus 80,000 Chinese, the Department of Sociology at Maynooth University released a study in 2006 estimating that the real number of Chinese people living in Ireland was somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000. The study's estimate was made using work permits, visa data, and residency figures. Only 16,533 Chinese people filled in the 2006 census. 20,000 ethnic Chinese filled in the 2016 census, half had Irish citizenship, right? So, yeah, they, they want to keep blending in uh, other cultures, uh, other races, and so on, uh, suppressing the data until it's got a momentum and a voting block that's too late to turn back. One in four. The number of children in Ireland who were born to a non-Irish mother, according to a 2014 study conducted by Trinity College Dublin. 120,000, the approximate number of migrants who have been given Irish citizenship between 2011 and 2018. And remember, this is in a population of just a couple million, right? The, uh, the ratio would be millions in, in the United States. Well, I guess it is, right? 115,000, the approximate number of citizens from non-EEA countries who were legally living in Ireland at the end of 2016. English schools, sometimes called visa factories, have been a popular way for non-EEA nationals to attain work visas. Children of migrants can get Irish citizenship if their parents have been in Ireland legally for at least three years at the date of birth. 250,000, the number of applications for citizenship, asylum and visas, Minister of Justice Charles Flanagan says his department deals with in Ireland per year, per year, 250,000. Again, it's just a population of a couple mil. See, now, people want to come to white countries because they're peaceful, they're stable, they're economically productive, and so on. But if enough non-whites come to white countries, you don't get the economic productivity, you don't get the lack of corruption, you don't get the stability anymore. Like, it's sorry. It's just the way that it is. 20,000 to 26,000, the estimated number of illegal immigrants living and working in Ireland in 2015, according to the Migrant Rights Center. The estimated number of their children was 5,000. And again, you can multiply this by 10 or more uh, to get a ratio for some place like Canada and so on. Ah. <sighs> In March 2017, the Sinn Féin spokesman on housing, Owen O'Brien, said in the Doyle, the Irish Parliament, that there were 126,000 illegals living in Ireland whom he wanted to regularize, which means pass to citizenship, right? 20,000, the number of minors with deportation orders who have been granted Irish citizenship over the last five years, according to Minister of Justice Charles Charlie Flanagan. Less than 1% of deportation orders against minors were enforced. Less than 1%. Can you imagine? The taxes that are ripped from your wallet by force to pay for all of this social engineering. Imagine if only 1%, less than 1% of the 
of tax liens were enforced. Right? Well, see, that's different. They want to enforce the collection of taxes. They don't want to enforce deportation orders. And this is because the left has lost legitimacy, so they need to replace the voters because they can't win the argument. And people from the third world vote. Like, if you want smaller government, the people from the third world are your direct political enemies on average. It's just, again, wish it were different. It's not the way things are. 62,032, the number of Muslims in Ireland, according to the 2016 census. 1.3% of the population, just over half, had Irish citizenship. Is that accurate? Who knows? 5,790, the estimated number of females living in Ireland who have experienced female genital mutilation. While 2,639 girls are estimated to be at risk of being subjected to it. How many have been prosecuted? Second highest, Ireland's ranking in a list of countries ranked by number of ISIS fighters per overall Muslim population in a University of Jerusalem study. Second highest out of all the countries. Over 779,000 passports were issued in 2017, according to the Department of Foreign Affairs annual report. <sighs> Guys, what are you doing? What are you doing? You've you, you got to wake up to this stuff. You, you, you've got to get some people in who are going to get control over this stuff. You know, do, do what the French do. You know, be, be activists. 70%, the percentage of people in Adamstown who were born to non-Irish parents, according to an RTE report in February 2018. 90%, the percentage of students with a migrant background in one north inner city Dublin school. 22%, the percentage of students in one west Dublin school who did not use English or Irish as a first language. Don't worry, cultural cohesion is just around the corner. 14.1% the percentage of under-18s in Ireland who do not speak Irish or English at home, according to the 2016 census. You know, unless you have a lot of Gaelic works translated into Arabic that are highly popular, <laughs> you're going to lose everything. Lose everything. 40%. The percentage of the population of Balichaunas in Mayo who are white Irish. Minority already. Balichaunas in Mayo is the town with the fewest Irish people in Ireland. Social cohesion was described as being under threat in one local news report in 2015. Yep, yeah, the center cannot hold. Things fall apart. 26.4%. The percentage of child protection cases who were immigrant parent families in 2015. Oh yeah, third world does treat their children unbelievably terribly as a whole. A report into identity fraud obtained by the Irish Times in 2006 under the Freedom of Information Act found there was an organized network which involved huge trade in genuine documents such as P45s, tax credits, certs, and social services cards in order to obtain PPS numbers. 1900, the number of applications made in 2010 by non-EU nationals for residents based on marriage to an EU national in Ireland under EU treaty rights. The numbers involved were almost equal to Ireland's asylum applicant application numbers that year. The largest non-EU nationality group making such applications were from Pakistan, which accounted for nearly 20% of all EU TR applications. Two-thirds of these Pakistani applications involved an EU partner for the Baltic states. More than 50%. The percentage of all marriages in Ireland between men from outside the EU and non-Irish EU women in 2011 who were believed by the Irish police to have been shams. right? Sham citizenship grabbing marriages. More than 50%. It's a great thing that we have all this pathological altruism and benevolence and openness and welcoming and warmness so people can rip us off. The men in these sham marriages were typically from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Ten percent. 
the approximate percentage of asylum seekers who were granted refugee status in Ireland up to 2017. Hmm, only 10%. 80%, the percentage of deportation orders on failed asylum seekers which are not implemented according to ESRI. Right, so only 10% of them are legit, 80% of them deportation is not enforced. So then just come, come, get welfare. In January 2018, the Irish Independent reported on an alleged undeclared scheme being operated by the immigration authorities allowing failed asylum seekers without a criminal record and who had been in Ireland for five years or more to stay. Legal professionals working on asylum cases referred to this scheme as the scheme that doesn't exist. The five leading countries of origin for asylum applications in 2017 were Georgia, Albania, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, which are not acknowledged conflict zones with high grant rates. Right. If you're a Muslim in a Muslim country, are you fleeing persecution? Civil war doesn't count for being an asylum seeker, uh, war zones as a whole. You just make up these rules and ignore these rules. That's the way it works, right? 75%, the percentage of asylum seekers who were granted refugee status in Ireland in 2017 at first instance, according to Eurostat. So there was this family reunification scheme for refugees. It used to allow them to bring in their spouses, parents, siblings, cousins, nephews, nieces, grandparents, and all children, including adults. So from 1996 till about 2015, it was in operation. In 2015, it was reduced in scope to allow only for spouses, parents, and children under 18, which is the UN minimum requirement. The Minister for State and Equality, Immigration, and Integration, David Stanton, previously told the Doyle, the Parliament, that before the old expanded family reunification program had been reduced in scope, one refugee had applied to bring in 70 of their family members. The average number per application was 20. So you get one person, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 come in. Who's asking you whether you want this or not? You've been forced to pay for it. Do you have any say on whether it happens or not? Failed asylum seekers who received Leave to remain can also avail a family reunification. Now, there are multiple NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and all parties in the Irish Parliament, except the one in power, support expanding the scope of the family reunification scheme again, which means massive multiples of the numbers we're talking here. Massive. 3.3%, the percentage of 10 to 14-year-olds who were of African origin in the 2016 census. This peak can be attributed to the period between 1998 and 2004 when citizenship through birth was a constitutional right and pregnant women were flying in. So here you can see the chart and as you can see it's clustered around the younger group and the younger group is likely to have higher birth rates as they move through life. 58% This is the percentage of households who were on the waiting list for social housing in 2011 in North Dublin who were not Irish citizens. 30.5% were non-EU citizens. The figure was 29.5% nationwide. So remember, they've got this big plan, you see, over 25 years. They're going to build 550,000 new homes to take into account all the people who are going to come into Ireland. But of course... There's a big waiting list for social housing as it stands based upon existing immigration to a large degree. What makes you think that the planning is going to be any better in the future than it has been in the past? 15.7% of the Irish population were listed as foreign-born in the 2011 census. 36%, the percentage of households who were on the waiting list for social housing in 2017 in North Dublin who were not Irish citizens. 14.8% were non-EU citizens. Figure was 27.7% nationwide. So, 2011, census 15.7 listed as foreign-born. A vast undercounting, I assume. By 2016, five years later, we've gone from 15.7 to 17.3% of the Irish population listed as foreign-born. 110,000 people. The number of migrants who have been granted Irish citizenship in the interim years between 2011 and 2017, who now count as Irish, which masks accurate figures for migrants. Six-year period in a tiny island with a few million population, 110,000 people granted Irish, Irish citizenship. 
Approximately 50% of all migrants live in the Dublin area compared to roughly a third of all Irish citizens, according to the 2016 census, right? So you say you want diversity, you don't get diversity with mass cross-cultural immigration. You don't get diversity because what happens? Well, it's called the lunchroom test. The Asians sit with the Asians, the whites sit with the whites, the blacks sit with the blacks. Uh, and uh, as Muhammad Ali said, you know, birds of a feather flock together. It's just the way things are. We can, you know, like, like the communists wish that human beings weren't motivated by self-interest, we can wish that human beings weren't motivated by tribalism. But so what? We, we could wish that, that it rained honey so that we didn't need to go to the store, but all we end up doing is starving to death if that's what we genuinely act on. So you don't get diversity. What happens is the people from Somalia move into Ireland and then they cluster in a particular community and everybody else moves out and you get this cyst that falls around this community. Actually, it's more of a welfare mode, right? Because in the past, people came to the West for freedom. Now they come for free stuff. And the welfare state creates this moat around the society. You don't have to work. You don't have to learn the language or the culture. You don't have to integrate. You can just live off the taxpayer teat and there's no diversity. There are these hard delineated lines. People don't cross them. There's no diversity at all. All you end up is with basically conquered territory. So one example of what is being counted is an Irish family in the housing statistics being given their second council home by the leader of Ireland, Leo Varadka, after outgrowing their old home in North Dublin. Here is a picture of an Irish family. I was born in Ireland, spent a lot of time in Ireland. 35% the percentage of rent supplement paid out to house non-Irish citizens in 2015. Over 520 million euros were spent nationally on rent supplement in 2012, according accounting for half of all residential rents in Ireland. Right, so if they're supposed to be all these immigrants, these migrants, these, these uh, refugees, so economically valuable that we, we're going to use them to shore up the economy. Nonsense. Rent supplement is a means-tested payment for certain people living in private rented accommodations who cannot provide for the cost of their accommodations from their own resources. 60 9.8% of non-Irish citizens were in the private rental sector in 2015 compared to 11.8% for Irish citizens. One in five. The number of TDs, representatives in the Irish parliament, who are landlords or who invest in property. Ooh, isn't that interesting? So 20% of the representatives in the Irish parliament are landlords or property investors, and don't you just know what happens when they open up the floodgates to foreign migration into Ireland? Oh, it drives up the value of their real estate. It drives up the value of their holdings. Wow, with no conflict of interest there, I believe that the rent has increased by approximately 30 pieces of silver a month. 40 million euros, the annual rent paid to Ireland's largest landlord, who is Canadian. Iris REIT launched in 2014 and has built up a portfolio of 2,288 apartments across Dublin. It's a great market, remarked David Ehrlich, the CEO of Iris REIT. We've never seen rental increases like this in any jurisdiction that we're aware of. I truly feel badly for the Irish people, he says, of climbing rents. But answerable to Iris Reed's investors, he says he's not going to put the brakes on just yet. The love of money is the root of evil. One third. The percentage of families being put up in hotels in emergency accommodation by the Irish government, despite having no right to social housing because they are mostly not EU citizens, according to the housing minister. And this is the terrible, terrifying, horrifying things that happen, a thing that happen when if, if someone is non-white, particularly if they're, they're black or, or Indian or so on, if they're not white and you attempt to enforce the law, then the media and special interest groups and racial advocacy groups scream racism at you until your life is destroyed. 
and you end up not with multiculturalism, which is everyone thinks, oh, well, you just get different restaurants and so on. No, you end up with multi-legalism. Now, multi-legalism is a very, very different situation. Multi-legalism is when the laws can no longer be consistently applied because of racial tensions. I mean, you can see this, you can see this with the um, uh, Middle Easterners uh, and, and to some degree the Muslims, although it's not a race, in England, where laws just aren't enforced. Because if you enforce, like if you have a group that is disproportionately committing crime and you apply the law equally, then everyone says, oh, there's too many of this group in the crime statistics. It's got to be racism. You've got to cut back on arresting these people when they may be committing crimes at a higher rate because of lower IQ issues, because of lack of opportunity issues, because of ideological issues. Do you view people who aren't part of your particular ethnic or religious group as less than you? Do you, do you say, oh, well, we can prey on them and it doesn't really matter? So there could be lots of reasons as to why a particular group has higher representation in crime statistics. But the answer that is constantly screamed, if there's disproportionate representation in crime statistics based on race, racism, racism, white privilege, blah, blah, blah. And then you say, okay, well, we can't apply the law to these people anymore. And your country has fallen apart fundamentally. 90%, the percentage of the homeless in Dublin's own oldest homeless charity workshop who are Eastern European. Declaring as homeless is the fastest way to get up the housing list. 300. The number of new homes needed every week for population growth of 1,000 per week in Ireland, according to Ossie and Smith, a Green Party councillor. Now, if you have people who are enormously economically productive in, then there's going to be a drive for houses, so it's going to push the housing prices up, uh, which, you know, is tough for everyone, but it stimulates for the construction of new housing. But if you've got people coming in and they're dumping on welfare, then there's no incentive to build lots of new homes for them. And so the government has to step in and build the homes and tax, and it's inefficient and environmentally destructive and economically destructive. And it... The Central Statistics Office, the CSO, said the population grew 64,500 in the year, over the year to April 2018. Of the 90,300 who immigrated, 28,400 were Irish nationals returning, 31.5. Of the 56,000 who emigrated, 28,300 were Irish nationals, 50%. Net inward migration among non-Irish nationals was estimated to be plus 33,920. Right, if you understand. In September, the ESRI, Economic and Social Research Institute, commented on the ongoing Irish housing crisis. They said there was no end in sight to the rent and house price spiral. Supply is still well below demand, and falling unemployment, wage growth, and inward migration are all set to drive prices higher, it said. Sure, if you restrict the building of new houses, or if you, and or if you import people who, because of lack of training, lack of language skills, lack of IQ, and so on, can't be economically productive, well, then... You put them in uh, hotels, you, you raise taxes, you, you put them in, in flats, and then that drives other people out upwards. Drive, uh, why do you want? Nobody wants, nobody wants this stuff. Well, I guess except the people coming in and the lefty politicians who get to virtue signal with other people's money. So what is the impact on housing? Well, in November 2018, the ESRI has said that in order to meet housing demand, there needs to be an influx of immigrant construction workers. Ah, you see, to house the immigrants who are coming in, you need to bring immigrants in to build the houses. You see how this all works? IBEX said in January 2019 that 60 to 80,000 migrant construction workers were needed to meet housing and infrastructure demands, but questioned where these workers would live. See, where are the workers going to live? who are building houses for the people who can't afford to buy those houses without government assistance. In November 2018, Taoiseach Leo Varadkar remarked, to solve this very real problem that we have, housing, the first thing we have to do is drive supply. We have a population that increased by 65,000 last year, and so logically every year we need about 30 or 35,000 new homes. And we're going to do that. And I believe we need more social housing and public housing. In fact, this year, there will be about 7,000 new social houses added to the stock. But there's probably about 20 or 25% of people who, for one reason or another, will never be able to own their own home. And that's the kind of level of social housing we need to have in 
the country, around 20 or 25 percent. At the moment, it's only 10. So over the next decade, we are going to build probably about 100,000 to provide about another 110,000 social housing units. And that's exactly what we intend to do. I think that is just common sense. The vanity, the, the, the megalomania. The, the... I'd like to say it's shocking, but it's not. The permanent underclass. You see, they're building housing for a permanent underclass. 20 to 25% of people who are coming into the country will never be able to own their own home. So they know that they're not going to be economically productive. You see it right there. Building a permanent underclass of people who are going to consistently vote for the left. Bigger government, more taxes, more spending, more immigrants. You lose control of your country like that. Well, for unemployment, according to Eurostat in Ireland, the economic activity rate for Irish nationals aged 20 to 64 was 76.2%. For non-EU citizens, it was 63%. For citizens of other EU member states, the figure was 78.8%. Now, 63%, you may say to yourself, could be a little high. It might be a little high. My question is, how much of this is make work projects? How much of this is government, quote, employment? How much of this is driven by affirmative action laws? How much would it really be in a free market? Well, in a free market, there wouldn't be this mass migration into a country because there'd be no welfare state. There's no reason to come. The weather's worse and you can't get work. Non-EU citizens aged 20 to 64 were, in 2013, twice as likely, 21.3% to be unemployed in one of the EU's 28 member states compared to nationals, 10%. Again, according to Eurostat. So more than twice as likely to be unemployed. But don't worry, they're going to prop up the, all the boomers' retirements. 100 and 7,767. The number of foreign nationals who were given a PPS number in 2016, allowing them to work in Ireland. 52,000. The number who subsequently registered some form of employment activity that year. Ah, see? Just a little under half. You give them the license to work, and then maybe a little less than half of them will actually end up working. The employment rate for African nationals in the 15 to 64 year age, uh, year age group in Ireland was 45% compared to 66% for all Irish nationals in 2017, according to the ESRI. And the other thing too is that they're going to be working for less, they're going to be working for cheaper, which prevents Irish nationals from getting jobs because, you know, you used to get jobs as teenagers and now if they're being done by immigrants, uh, you teenagers don't get work and it's t and, you know, it's a problem. I mean, the fact that I got my first job when I was uh, 10 uh, and so on was, was kind of important for helping me understand this. It's one thing to live in the amniotic sack of government spending forever, and then when you finally get your job, your beliefs are kind of already hardwired and formed in your mind. But if you start working early, you're like, wow, it's a lot of deductions. I guess I'm understanding where all of this money is coming from, right? Africans' pattern of employment has persisted. Throughout the recession and recovery, their employment rates actually declined between 2016 and 2017, when most labor market outcomes for nearly every other nationality group improved. In 2017, only 53% of African nationals were economically active. Now, well, here's the other thing, too. So there's something called regression to the mean, which means that if you have a very, very tall Chinese guy then it's likely that his kids are going to be shorter than he is, right? If you have a very, very short Danish person, right, tall group, if you have a very, very short Danish person, odds are his kids are going to be taller. If he's very short, his kids are going to be taller than he is. So it's regression to the mean. It means that things kind of average out over time. So if the average IQ of a particular population is, say, 80 or 85, then you can get people who have an IQ of 110. They'll come to your country and do very well. But their kids, their kids will regress to the mean. And then everyone, like, they're going to say, well, I did well, but my kids aren't doing as well. It must be because whites are getting more racist. There's more structural superiority privilege racism going on. And this is why in England, the first generation of Muslims are relatively uh, liberal. But then the second generation tend to be more extreme, more fundamentalist. Perfectly explainable by regression to the mean. Again, I'm not saying I like it. I hate that this is the way it is, but it is the way it is. 
percent, the percentage of eligible workers among Roma, right, this is, um, oh, I guess, gypsies and so on, who reported that they were in employment, according to a Department of Justice study. According to Pavi Point community development worker Gabby Muntin, in 2018, the figure was 10 percent. A very, a very low IQ population as a whole. 5,000, the estimated number of Roma living in Ireland in 2018. No fiscal boost from EU migrants in Ireland. Migrant EU workers have not boosted Ireland's public finances, according to a University of Uppsala study in 2018. Okay, this is all you really need to know about finances in, in Western countries. White males pay taxes. They're the only group that is net positive for governments. In other words, they pay more in taxes than they take out in services. Uh, women of all races, uh, minorities as a whole, uh, they don't. Uh, well, it's the exception of uh, East Asians, right? Chinese, Japanese, and uh, a lot of Jews. But as far as um, uh, overall contribution to the finances, it's white males. And there's no accident. This is why white males are so attacked. Because if white males become self-aware, right? If they start to work for in-group uh, ethnic and, and gender preferences, then the whole scheme might come tumbling down. You don't want your livestock testing the fence, right? 80%. The percentage of immigrants assigned PPS numbers in 2008 who had no employment at any time in 2013. 80%. 22,573 people out of 127,048, or just under 18%, who arrived in 2008 were on social welfare in 2013, up 266 on the 2012 figure. And here's the thing too, like like the social capital uh, and economic capital of just knowing how to go and get a job, how to do an interview, how to negotiate challenging bosses. Because you know, when you get your first jobs, the bosses kind of suck because bosses who are really good aren't put in charge of new workers, they're put in charge of more experienced workers. So you get the worst bosses. Learning how to deal with that, how to, you know, bite down your frustration and uh, just work and, and get ahead. You could lose all of that knowledge in like one generation of people not working. And then getting them out of that is... Virtually impossible. The CSO cited several reasons for the inc increase in social welfare activity, including the birth of a child and job seekers' claims. Some 38% of the 75,812 foreign nationals assigned PPS numbers in 2013 found employment that year. 40,000. The number of jobless migrants who should be paid to return to their countries of origin, according to Leo Varadkar in 2008. He claimed they cost the state in excess of 400 million euros a year. Leo Varadkar became Taoiseach, or Prime Minister in June 2017, but never repeated this suggestion. So they should be, right? Of course, right? So the way it works, it's, it's like the the Democrats in, in America, oh, we want a wall, we need a wall, illegal immigration is dead. just saying that, right? The moment that the wall actually becomes reasonable or possible, then they stop saying it. So when this guy wants to get into power, this Leo guy, then he'll talk all about this stuff. But then if he does actually get in power, he doesn't want to talk about it. 40 million euros, the amount of money Ireland has paid out in child welfare benefits to the families of almost 8,000 children living in other European Union countries over a three-year span. Three-year span from 2014 to 2017. The vast majority was paid to families of more than 4,500 children living in Poland who were entitled to 140 euros a month per child from the Irish government. <laughs> you should check out my documentary on Poland. fdrurl.com forward slash Poland. fdrurl.com forward slash Poland. I think you'll find it very enlightening. Enlightening? Enlightening. The highest rate of child welfare in Poland is 30 euros, and unlike in Ireland, families are means tested. Yeah, good cash from foreign governments. The standard job seekers allowance rate is 198 euros per week in Ireland. You can be part time employed for up to three days of the week and receive a lesser job seekers allowance. Now, of course, this is money all taken from people who could have otherwise created jobs with them. Healthcare. This is a huge issue. One million. The number of extra people the health service will have to deal with by 2030, with the major driver being inward migration, according to an ESRI report, projections of demand for healthcare in Ireland 2015 to 2030. 
The report said this would have significant implications for health services and demand across all health and social care sectors will, quote, increase substantially, end quote, every year up to 2030. The report notes that between 1996 and 2016, Ireland's population bucked the trend elsewhere in the EU, growing by 31% as opposed to just 6% across the Union. The report's nine authors project that Irish fertility rates will remain at 1.94, which is below the rate of 2.1 necessary to sustain a population at its current level. In February of 2018, it, is, it was reported that the HSE, Health Services Executive, is battling a new wave of patients struggling with polio issues 30 years after the last recorded case. You know, they never talk about biohazard diversity, diversity of viruses, when they start talking about diversity. Now, it's all about curry shops. Up to three new patients a month are presenting with post-polio syndrome at Beaumont Hospital, most of them drawn from among the new Irish community. 70% are foreign-born, right? So you've got an aging population, and then you've got an inbred population having a lot of kids, which means, um, well, untold numbers of white Irish people are going to die because they're waiting and they can't get access to healthcare. Like, Canada's taking, what, 300,000 people, mostly from the third world, every year. And when I had to go and see a doctor, I, had to see, I was referred for, to a specialist for something. I was told that a specialist could see me in 11 months. By which time I'm either better or dead, right? A record number of 512 people were diagnosed with HIV in 2016. 61% of the people diagnosed with HIV were born outside Ireland. 25% were born inside Ireland and 13% did not have info on their country of birth. Sex between men accounted for 51% of transmissions where information was available. Of the 311 cases among known migrants, 36% were born in sub-Saharan Africa, while 33% were born in Latin America. 53% of all female cases were born in sub-Saharan Africa. Which, again, if you look at portion of the population, way, way overrepresented. 30% of migrants diagnosed in 2016 were transferring their care to Ireland. Well, sure. The annual cost to treat HIV per case is 25,000 euros. There was a 6% increase in STI diagnosis overall in 2018. These are sexually transmitted uh, diseases. When broken down, there were six... 1,739 cases of chlamydia, 1,989 of gonorrhea, 1,383 of herpes, 19 cases of lymphogranuloma, glad I don't know how to pronounce that, sounds bad, For, 441 cases of syphilis, and 53 reported cases of trichomono, trichomoniasis, trichomoniasis. Apparently, that affects your ability to pronounce trichomoniasis. So, yeah, syphilis. You know, you always hear about this this rumor. This this it's a lie. It's a lie that the, the that the Europeans uh, brought all of these smallpox infected blankets and and used it to to wipe out the indigenous population. Actually, uh, so, some of the illnesses came from seals. I, I'm I'm not kidding. You can look it up. Some of the illnesses to North America. But you never hear about how. The indigenous population of North America introduced Europeans to tobacco and syphilis. You never, never really hear about that. There's no money in it, right? No guilt. It's like you never hear that 90% of the slaves that were bought by whites in, in Europe, like to ship to the New World, to ship to North America, 90% of the slaves were actually caught by other blacks, right? And, and who's worse? Who's more morally culpable, the dealer or the user? Yeah. See, but there's, so, you know, the, the blacks in Africa owe massive apologies for facilitating and making the slave trade possible, but no one's going to demand that they apologize because there's no money in it, right? It's just a slavery shakedown. Well, you go to where the white guilt is, that's where the money is, and you yell racism and privilege and all that until you get money. Crime. They have 7,490. The number of interpreters required in Irish courts in 2015 costing 1 million euros. The figure for 2016 was 8,015. So, yeah, you've got uh, massive inefficiencies when it comes to multi-language societies. 
Polish, Romanian, Lithuanian, Russian, Latvian, Mandarin, Portuguese, Czech, French, Arabic, and other. Especially, you know, you've got socialized healthcare, so you've got to have this giant army of interpreters. And uh, if you get anything wrong, you get a lawsuit. So, yay, diversity. 30%. The number of the non-Irish prisoners in 2008, according to the Irish Prison Service, the figure was reduced to 17% in 2014, possibly masked by the increase in citizenship given to migrants. In 2008, Africans who were less than 1% of the population were 6.9% of the prisoners. That dropped to 2.1% in 2014. And again, that's most likely because of mass citizenship waves. But that's, you know, so uh, blacks commit shockingly high proportions of violent crime shockingly high like if you look at the black young black male population a couple of percentage points are responsible for close to half the murders in the united states and again it's iq uh, and uh, there's some cultural cultural stuff involved resentment rage at whites and so on and of course black assaults on whites are vastly greater than white assaults on blacks uh, far many more whites have been murdered over the last few decades by blacks than blacks were ever lynched in the south and um Oh, it's, it's, it's appalling. I mean, this is why people stay home. This is why their kids have such a tough time in school. The, the level of violence among the black community is shockingly high. That's in America. In Africa, it's even worse. 66. The number of different nationalities in Irish jails in 2016, with Polish, Lithuanian, British, and Romanian men forming the largest ethnic groupings. That's a little confusing because, again, I don't know what the statistics are. If they say they're British... Does that mean they are Pakistani with a British passport? Who knows? I mean, it's, it's, it's tragic because now you have to kind of look for what's not there these days. I mean, that's what's tragic, right? So if, if say, blacks were not prone to crime, then these, this data would be there. But it's like where, wherever the data is suppressed, wherever you can't get the information, that's when you know it's bad. The communications officer for the Irish Prison Service remarked in February 2018, we want the best talent we can get to join the IPS. We would love to see more ethnic minorities putting themselves forward because we need them. The prison population is completely different to what it was about 30 years ago. More diverse and much, much, much larger. In April 2018, the chief superintendent of the Laos Offaly Garda Division told the local radio station that foreign criminal gangs from Eastern Europe were traveling to Ireland to commit burglaries. He said the gangs would come in for a short stay, commit serious amounts of burglaries and leave Ireland afterwards using EU free movement, right? Good luck going back to Eastern Europe to, to get them. Now, these are whites. These are white foreign criminal gangs. So it's not all just about race, obviously, right? Eastern Europe was subjugated under communism for a long time. And so gaming the system uh, and, and sneaking the system and, and conning the system that is totalitarian is kind of worked into the blood of a lot of cultures. African gangs went on a mugging rampage and beat up several youngsters in North Dublin this past Halloween. A pregnant lady who intervene, intervened in the assault of one child was told that her baby would be cut out of her. A source told Dublin Live that the towns were chosen over lack of police presence, right? So then what happens is, of course, and you can see this with the moped gangs in London, is that uh, blacks, uh, Arabics, and so on, a variety of ethnicities will say... Well, we're overrepresented among crime statistics. It's racism. You've got to cut back on your policing because your police are clearly bigoted and racist and right. So then what happens? You get a get out of jail free card. In fact, you get a never get to jail free card. And then that only, of course, exacerbates the criminal tendencies within particular ethnicities because now they know that they can pretty much get away with anything and it just gets worse and worse and worse. The pregnant woman was quoted that she had been told by one gang member that she was just giving us hassle because we're black, right? I mean, this is a, a strategy that is used, right? So, you know, black guys can go up to white girls and say, I want to go out with you. And if the white girls say no, they say, oh, you're just racist. It's like, okay, I'll go out with you. It's like, can't have rational discussions because race overwhelms everything. Several locals told how the gangs use social media to organize their rampage, even bragging to their victims online about how easy it is to organize posh bashing sprees. And posh is, you know, Port Albert, stop at home. It's, it's um, wealthier people. 
The rampage wasn't the first time African gangs in Dublin have organized for violence in the town with no police station. Shoppers had to flee in terror in 2017 in Donabat when 100 gang rivals clashed. African gangs in Dublin. African gangs in Dublin. You can keep repeating it. It doesn't make any more sense no matter how often you repeat it. In January of 2018, the town of Lusk was forced into lockdown when a 100-strong African gang invaded the village, throwing stones at buses and smashing up property. There's a reason Africa is the way it is. It doesn't change when the air gets damper. In West Dublin, Irish vigilantes were suspected of taking matters into their own hands after a number of taxi and delivery drivers who were robbed by African gangs when one home in Tyrrellstown was firebombed twice in the same weekend. Yeah, look, absolutely. No question, this is what's going to happen. There's no question this is what's going to happen. And then it's going to be like white Nazi mobs, KKK mobs attacking poor innocent minorities. If, if, you, if you don't ask people if they want different ethnicities to come in and feed off their tax dollars, if you don't ask people whether they want this kind of diversity, and you force them to pay for it, and you scream at them and try to jail with jail them if they complain about it. People get mad. Of course they do. Of course they do. If there was a country in Africa where white people were swarming in, not working, taking welfare, causing a lot of crime, we would have sympathy for the blacks in that, I would, you would, we would have sympathy for the blacks in the country. They didn't ask for this. The government has been corrupted. It's now acting against the wishes of the citizens. It's inviting people in because they're going to vote for that government. And of course, the people are going to get angry. And of course, there's going to be blowback, right? You oppress people, you oppress people. And diversity in this method of being implemented is absolutely oppression. You oppress people, they're going to fight back. It's, it, it's going to happen. And then everyone's going to be like, oh, this is so terrible. Who could have seen this coming? Anybody with half a brain. A 16-year-old who attacked and robbed a delivery man in what a judge described as an extremely vicious and mindless assault was given a four-year suspended sentence in October 2018. His youth prevented him from being named, but one report revealed his parents had moved to Ireland from the Congo. Right. So there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever, and this has already happened, that... People who are perceived to be saying mean things on the internet are going to get longer prison sentences than people who beat up other people, rape women, and so on. When African muggers started targeting the wealthier area of Clontarf, national media reported on the problem for the area. Right? Oh, no. It could be affecting, right? Though... And I'm, I really do apologize for all this pronunciation. I did do some, I couldn't do it all, or didn't do it all. Though Gardai, the Irish police, have a low presence in many towns, they have been using sophisticated methods to catch criminals. In November 2018, they used thermal imaging from a helicopter to catch two African muggers who had robbed a man with a long steak knife in Lusk after they hid under some brambles during a chase. So there's this horrible thing that's happened in, in Europe, in the West, in Europe in particular, they looked at America and they said, wow, there's a lot of gun violence. So we're going to ban guns and we're going to import a lot of people from Africa and the Middle East. You couldn't, you couldn't misunderstand, you couldn't misinterpret, you couldn't miss the actual reality more if you had really, really tried. The reality is that America doesn't have a gun problem. It doesn't have a violence problem. It has a black problem problem with regards to uh, crime, with regards to, to violence. The statistics are very, very clear. And I've got done present, you can watch my presentations of truth about crime and so on, it's very, very clear. It's not the presence of guns in America that causes the high crime rate. If you normalize by race, whites in America are about as violent as whites everywhere in the world. Whites in, in Brussels, whites in Ireland, well, it's about the same, which means, um, less violent than Hispanics, less violent than blacks, but more violent, whites are more violent than East Asians and Jews, on average. 
So Europe looked at America and said, whoa, the problem is guns. So we're going to ban guns. And because they didn't say, well, the issue or the challenge is having a, a large black and Hispanic population, say, well, we're going to ban guns and import lots of blacks. Which now you have a fairly violent population and a disarmed domestic population. Like, I know it's, it's difficult to talk about this stuff. I understand. Like, I really, really do. I understand. But I was always raised to tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell the truth no matter what. These, this is, these are facts that we need to deal with because the consequences of not dealing with them are going to be catastrophic beyond anything that has ever before been experienced in human history, you understand? If we end up with race wars, if we end up with Sharia, if we end up like the, the, the rivers of blood, the rivers of blood that were talked about in the past will flow. I mean, it, it's going to be appalling beyond anything that has ever been experienced before in, in human history. In 2015, the racial tension in Balbriggan was highlighted on a radio phone-in show after a video of a brawl between black and white school children had gone viral. See, this is the other thing too. I'm sorry about all these asides, but it's important. I don't know how the races could get along if there weren't people constantly talking and, and, and setting the races against each other. So primarily leftists, although it happens on the right as well. People saying, well, you're hard done by and your ancestors were stolen from and those whites have privilege and they racist and they hate you and right, right? Fomenting all of this hatred. So those people aren't going to stop, which means that uh, multiculturalism is going to always descend into violence because like if you have a marriage, it's a good marriage, and, and you have some friend who starts stirring up a lot of trouble in your marriage and getting you to complain, like maybe you just get rid of that friend and your marriage, but some marriages are going to start to collapse under that weight, right? So I don't know. I don't know how we could get along if people weren't constantly stirring up trouble between the races, but given that they are, it's a reality we have to acknowledge. We don't have to, but we don't. Mosnia, Direct Provision Center for Asylum Seekers, is nearby Balbriggan, and many former residents have settled in the seaside town and surrounding areas. When 700 Balbriggan residents protested outside the Garda station in November 2017, they referred to antisocial groups terrorizing the town. But they were still branded racist by some callers to a radio show about the protest, right? It's like Western civilization versus one two-syllable word, racist. In November 2018, the government announced that it would spend 20 million euros on a redevelopment scheme for Belbriggan, while the council would spend a total of 50 million euros in a capital investment over the next three years to solve the socio-economic issues. Right. Right. And this is the idea that you see crime arises from poverty. And so if you give poor people lots of money, there won't be crime anymore. False, false, false. Neighborhoods aren't criminal because they're poor. They're poor because they're criminal. This has been, and I've got a whole interview with Dr. Kevin Beaver uh, about this. You can look it up in my series on human intelligence. You, you, you give money to particular groups and it's almost always going to be misused. There's a reason why third world countries are so corrupt. And so this idea, well, we got a lot of crime. Let's spend a lot of money. It is... A lie. It's false. It makes things worse because now what you're doing is you're saying, oh, if you commit a lot of crime, we'll give you a lot of money. What do you think's going to happen? You pay people stuff. If somebody said to you, I'll give you a million dollars to shoplift something. Most people would uh, take the million, right? Oh, wait, if I commit crime, I get a lot of money. So sentences in the court system can often be lenient towards migrants. This is the multilegalism that I was talking about. When three Nigerians were found guilty of sexual assault on a 14-year-old girl, they each received a two-year suspended sentence for three years. On one occasion, the three Nigerians took turns raping the girl in a forest clearing. The court heard that one of them said, you look like you're going to cry. The girl slapped him across the face and asked, can you blame me? She said she was still on antidepressants and has had suicidal thoughts. Yeah, rape is a, it's an act of war because it renders a lot of women 
uh, girls, un unfit for motherhood and, and uh, their honor has been deflowered. It's not their fault. No, it's not their fault. They were raped. It's the fault of the people inviting all these people into the country. But if you look at the rape and sexual torture and abuse of little white girls in England under a largely Pakistani Muslim community, it is uh, an, an act of uh, sexual warfare against the population because then the women are messed up and they can't pair upon sometimes and they may not be as good a mother as and maybe guys don't want to date them because of this is too complicated, too messy. So it's a way of stopping the birth of the people that you rape to lowering their chances to have children and be effective parents. It is a form of, of warfare. So it's a uh, rape warfare. On delivering her sentence, Judge, oh look, it's a female, Judge Mary Ellen Ring noted that the sexual offense conviction might, quote, cause them to not get employment or to lose employment, and that this was punishment in itself. Punishment in itself. I mean, no. And that could only be theoretically possible if there weren't welfare programs. One of the Nigerians subsequently went on to be nominated for Young Player of the Year at a Dublin football club. When a Bangladesh national was found guilty of sexual assault on a six-year-old girl in a mosque, Judge, oh look, another lady judge, Judge Pauline Codd sentenced the man to 18 months imprisonment but suspended the final four months for a period of one year, in part because his being a Bangladesh national, quote, may make his imprisonment more difficult. Sexual assault on a six-year-old girl. Let's make sure he's comfy, though, right? Oh, ladies. Well, you're not going to be drafted to fight, so indulge yourself away. In May 2013, World Bank figures revealed that 600, sorry, 468 million euros in remittances were sent from Ireland to Nigeria in 2011. So basically, remittances are you, you've got some money in a, at the first world country, you send it to your family in the third world country. Now, a lot of this is welfare money, let's be honest, right? A lot of it is money extracted from the white population at the point of a gun, given to minority populations, minority populations fire that money overseas. Come on, we know that. Which sort of begs the question, why are people on welfare sending money overseas? Welfare is supposed to keep you from starving. If you have enough money to send overseas, I don't really think you need welfare. And that's why people are sent, this is why they're sent across the Mediterranean, it's why they're sent to the first world, why they're sent on these dangerous journeys, right? So they can get money from the white taxpayers and send it to people overseas. <sighs> 468 million euros in remittances. That was an average of more than 26,000 euros for each of the 17,642 Nigerian nationals in Ireland, including their children. Come on, where are they getting this money from? It's not all coming from the welfare state and unemployment insurance. It's coming from crime. It's coming from drugs. It's coming from human trafficking. Wake up. Please. 600,000 euros, the amount per day. The Immigrant Council said organized crime gangs were making by running an international sex trafficking network stretching from Nigeria and Cameroon to Ireland in 2015. Per day. 600 million, sorry, 600,000 euros per day. One of the largest welfare fraud cases in Ireland involved a couple who had arrived from Nigeria in 2006. The combined fraud totaled more than 400,000 euros and took place over a period of more than eight years. And then you get the cost of the investigation, and then you get the, cost, the cost of the trial, and then you get the cost of the imprisonment, which is probably going to be a suspended sentence with a lady judge. Sorry, I can't sentence you. I'm ovulating. Ah, you know, you stop having kids and or you don't spend time with your kids. The maternal instinct attaches to other things. An Irish police operation in September 2018 targeting a Nigerian money laundering network linked to a 15 million euro fraud saw 15 homes raided in five counties across the country. The police stressed that the operation was about gathering evidence to be used against a global criminal organization which has been linked to massive fraud in countries as far away as China. Polls. The population is not being asked 
if they want this. And they're not being presented with anything real. No costs, no cost-benefit analysis, no facts about race and IQ, no data from other countries being integrated. And it's all a lie. It's a falsehood. It's a propaganda. It's a con job. It's filthy. Filthy. The 2018 Esri, quote, Attitudes to Diversity in Ireland report found that 59% of the Irish public wanted to allow either just a few or no Muslim migrants to come and live in Ireland. 75% of the Irish public wanted to allow either just a few or no Roma migrants to come and live in Ireland. 42% of the Irish public wanted to allow either just a few or no European migrants to come and live in Ireland. No other ethnicities were polled for. People are desperate. People are desperate. They're having conversations in the basement. They're having conversations under the covers. They're having conversations encrypted. They are desperate. People in Europe are desperate. People in Canada are desperate for any kind of rational conversation about this massive, irreversible human experimentation. I mean, the left says they're into diversity. Go to your leftist campus and ask where the conservatives are. They have no interest in diversity whatsoever. The left only cares about all of the minorities who vote for the left. No interest in diversity. Certainly no intellectual diversity whatsoever. You can have curry socialism or you can have taco socialism, but you're getting socialism. A 2006 Irish independent slash RTE primetime poll found that more than half of young Muslims, 57%, believed Ireland should become an Islamic state. Hmm. And you see, that's just the Muslims who'd be willing to admit it, right? Remember, in Islam, you can lie to outsiders. 28% of young Muslims aged between 16 and 26 believed violence for political ends was sometimes justified. Try starting a group where the penalty for leaving the group is death. See whether you last. More than a third of all Muslims, 36%, said they would prefer Ireland to be ruled under Sharia law. This week, Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said that a man captured in Syria by militants fighting ISIS is entitled to consular assistance because he has an Irish passport. The man was born in Belarus. Look, that's all I can stomach. That's all I can take. Let's do some quick conclusions. Here are the facts that you need to understand. First of all, this is the greatest threat to your entire civilization, Ireland, that you have ever faced in your multi-thousand year history. The possibility, in fact, the inevitability, that if you allow yourself to be displaced and replaced by a third world population, that your country will turn into just another copy of Libya or Somalia or you name it. It, it. It's absolutely going to happen unless you act and you need to act now. You need to talk, you need to organize, you need to push back, you need to get some leaders in place who are gonna maintain the value and the integrity of your civilization. You cannot talk groups into becoming smarter. You can't talk groups into getting smarter any more than you can talk people into getting taller or I can conjure a lovely lush mohawk off the top of my head with caressing verbiage. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. You invite the third world, you become the third world. And you will become subjects and vassals and tax livestock used for the production of other groups' children. You will lose everything. You will be a minority within your own country within just a couple of decades. And trust me, when you become the minority, there's not going to be any affirmative action for you. We can see that from the example of South Africa. Whites, for better and for worse, have a concept of death before dishonor, that we would rather die than be dishonorable. Now, that has had great positive effects throughout human history. It wasn't the Jews who ended the slave trade. Quite the contrary. It wasn't the Muslims. It wasn't the Hindus. It wasn't the Zoroastrians. It wasn't the Buddhists. It was the white Western European Christians who ended the worldwide slave trade and spent untold amounts of blood, of tre blood and treasure in order to do so. The attempt to civilize the world, the attempt to turn the world into Europe has failed. And it has failed because of very specific biological, factual realities. Brain volume differs between the races. IQ differs between the races. Aggression differs between the races. 
These are realities. We can't wish them away. We can't ignore them, or if we do, it is to our certain demise. We have to recognize the reality of what is going on. You are not responsible for the sins of your ancestors any more than you can take pride in their achievements. The modern world is the creation of whites. Between 800 BC and 1950 AD, 98% of scientific progress came from Europe and North America, came from whites, almost overwhelmingly males. No white males, no modern world. That's the way it works. And if whites lose control of their countries, of their cultures, of their civilizations, well, the thought has struck me that this is why in a near infinite universe we haven't been visited by space aliens because you reach for the stars and your empathy is used to prey upon you. Right? Why is it that Islamic slavery, Islamic slavery was 200 times worse than the slaves that were taken to North America and taken to America in particular. And tens of millions of slaves were taken from Africa by the Muslims. The males were castrated, the women, who knows, right? Horrifying. There's not been any big mea culpa look in the mirror from the Muslim world saying, boy, we did this terrible, horrible, barbaric thing for a lot longer than the Christians ever did. No, people run to the Christians and run to the whites and say, oh, you bad slavery people. It's terrible. It's a shakedown. It's a pillaging. Whites participated in slavery for the shortest amount of time, and whites ended slavery. These are facts. It's just facts. It can't be denied. So the idea that you'd run to whites and complain about slavery, well, it's just because whites, in many ways, have a culture of death before dishonor. We will spend blood and treasure, sacrifice lives to end the scourge of slavery worldwide. Now, that death before dishonor is, I think, now being used against whites as a whole in that it is dishonorable to be racist. And therefore, if you say, no, we don't want more people from Somalia in our country, you say, oh, well, that's racist. It's terrible. We can't do that. We can't allow that. Now, prejudice is a problem in the world. Well, if you're not white, you really don't know that much about racism. I know that may sound shocking to you, but it's, it's a fact. Because if a white is racist to, say, a black person, then the media and, and, and his friends and family and, and everyone on social media piles onto the white guy and says, you're racist and tries to destroy his life. If a black man is racist to a white man, people don't even register it as real. That's real racism, when people don't even register it as occurring. That's real racism. And it's only whites who are subjected to it. And that's a fact. It's another fact. Prejudice is when you say, well, blondes are smarter than brunettes or something like that. You know, like just take a white population, right? Tall people are more moral than short people. Like the things that just don't make any sense, right? Where there are genuine differences, though, it is not prejudice to accept and acknowledge them. In fact, you end up not fighting racism by pretending that all groups are equal because all groups are not equal in each of their abilities. Everybody should be equal under the law. And I do not believe in any way, shape or form in any kind of racial superiority or inferiority. Each ethnicity has developed according to its local conditions for optimum survival. They're perfectly suited to their local conditions. There's nothing to do with superiority or inferiority. It's like saying, is a brown bear superior to a polar bear? Well, it's not. A brown bear is great in the woods and a polar bear is great on the snow. You switch them around though. <laughs> So each ethnicity has different strengths and weaknesses and imagining that we're all completely interchangeable is creating a situation where because of differences in IQ and differences in culture and difference in religiosity, you have some groups that are going to succeed in a free market meritocracy and some groups that are going to fail. And it's going to be, it's going to be exceptions. You never judge an individual by group averages, but there's going to be this issue. Now, the way that Ethnicities are being weaponized against whites is if you invite a lot of ethnicities who aren't going to do particularly well in a free market economy. And then you tell them that the only reason they're not doing well is that whites hate them and whites want to oppress them and whites want to hold them down. And we all have this secret handshake and we wake up in the morning and we brush our teeth and we comb our hair. And the first thing we do is we say, by gosh, how can I go out and oppress other ethnicities today? 
Well, if you set that situation up, you are setting up the conditions for a race war. We don't want that. We really, really don't want that. You have the right to live in peace and security within your own country. You have a right to take care of your community, your friends, your family, without having to nail yourself to the cross of all the problems in the world which are not of your making, not of your doing, and which you cannot fix. You have a right to borders. You have a right to cultural homogeneity. I mean, I went to Poland, and for the first time, I could go out and speak in public without fear of violence, without bomb threats, without death threats. That means something. That's valuable. That's something worth protecting. It's something worth treasuring. And when you think of the sacrifices your ancestors made to provide to you the freedoms, the liberties that you still treasure, you think of the enemies that they face down, natural enemies, uh, wild animals, diseases, inclement, horrible weather, storms at sea, and then the human enemies, the robbers, the predators, the armies that they face down. They did all of that to bring you what you have now, today, but which you will not keep. Think of everything that they stood up against to protect their civilization, your civilization. And all you have to do is stand up to one two-syllable word called racism. It's not a real word. It's not a true word. But it is a word that can undo everything that we have.